Welcome to Breaking News with Ben Hunt, Jack Forehand, and Matt Ziegler. Before we start, let me remind you what the show is not. Breaking News is not a show about fact-checking. Breaking News is not a show about saying whose bias is the one and only correct bias. And Breaking News is definitely not a show about calling out fake news. Breaking News is a show where we look at today's top stories and have a conversation around our favorite critical question, why am I reading this now? Drawing on the headlines we're tracking at fiatnews.com, join us as we talk about what's collectively making us tick with clear eyes, full hearts, and this obligatory disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast is advising you to buy or sell any security or to do anything with your money. Seriously, you should only act on investment advice from someone you know and someone who knows your unique situation. We are not that person. You're watching Breaking News on the Epsilon Theory YouTube channel. I'm Matt Ziegler, joined as always by Jack Forehand. Say hello, Jack. Hello, Jack. And Ben Hunt. Say hello, Ben. Hello, Ben. All right. Be beforehand, let me just say uh, our before the debate episode, which it came out really well. <laughs> and thanks yeah, to all the watchers. Thanks to the new watchers, a bunch of subscribers, uh, a bunch of new commenters. You can still watch it if you missed it. Epsilon Theory YouTube channel. Look for our last uh, breaking news on Biden's losing narrative strategy because we're proud of it. And well, this week, all right, in the zeitgeist, we're looking at what's next for election 2024. We've got a tweet of the week from former President Obama referencing Biden's debate performance. Jack, you've got a dumb question for us on measuring cognitive decline for people in public offices. I've got a cultish corner on the good, the bad and the random realities of luck. And that part, at least, is a little bit less Biden, a little more Beastie Boys. It's all intertwined somehow, I'm sure. But first, big picture. We're starting with the debate, the Biden narrative cracking. And, and Ben, I want you to start us off here because I think this is really important for the framing. We're doing this to show you can talk about this stuff. And it's important to unpack these layers of narrative strategy and whatever else without, you know, blowing up at the seams. Start me off in parable land. Talk to me about the game theory of the emperor's new clothes and tell me why that story is so important. I, I want everybody's brain on this first. The emperor's new clothes is the story that everyone knows that encapsulates the common knowledge game. Right. So there. And, you know, it's true. And you often find them in like Aesop's parables and all sorts of things. Um, game theory, because look, game theory, all, all it means is, is it's the, it's strategic interaction. It's how groups of people behave with each other. I know that, you know, that, you know, that I know it's, it's, it's what rational people do with each other. That's it. That's it. And it's, there are rules to game theory, like any game, there are rules to the game. And knowing those rules, knowing how human beings interact with each other, it, it, it gives us a lens through which to see the world, to make sense of the world when what's happening might not otherwise make sense. So, I, I love the, the Emperor's New Clothes. I think it's it's such an important story because I think the common knowledge game that it exemplifies is, oh, I, I just think it's the most important game we play as a, as a crowd, as a social animal, as, a, as an animal that wants to be part of a group, that behaves differently when it is part of a group, And nowhere do you see the the tension. The tension is the right word. The ten, and here's what I mean by the tension. The tension that that the emperor's new clothes explains. The tension that we want to explain about what happened after the debate is why do people act? When do people act on what they know? on what they see in the world. Because what we find 
and this is again why the 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 emperor's new clothes story is so good is that people don't act even though they know it's something important so of course the story of the emperor's new clothes everyone can see that the emperor is naked he is walking down the middle of the street naked as a jaybird and Everyone in the crowd sees it. We all know he's naked. We all, we all have that thought, yeah, the guy's naked. But we don't do anything about it. We go about our business. We applaud. We say, oh, yay, emperor. Because we, we're, we're somehow not sure. We're somehow not sure that our own eyes are telling us the truth. And we see with our own eyes the advisors and the courtiers of the emperor who are walking along pretending as if he's wearing some fine suit of clothes. So we say, okay, I'm not going to trust my own judgment, my own, my own knowledge. I just, I'll just go along. Until, and this is what cracks common knowledge. This is what changes common knowledge. Common knowledge being what we all know, that we all know. It's not what we all know, because we all know the guy's naked. We're not doing anything different. But when that little girl in the crowd yells out so loudly that everyone believes that everyone else in the crowd heard that little girl say that the the emperor is naked, that's where everything changes. And the crucial thing here is that that little girl, and in, in game theory terms, we call that little girl a missionary, because you get up in front of all the tribes people, like a missionary going to some, you know, tropical island, you get in front of everybody and you make this announcement where everybody hears you speak. That's the crucial thing. The crowd sees and hears that the crowd knows that the emperor is naked. And that's where everything changes. You had, you had a great quote in your piece. Behavior changes only when we believe that everyone else believes the information. That's what changes behavior. And, and I was thinking about my reaction. Like, if I had to rate Joe Biden's cognitive abilities before and after the debate, it's probably not that different. So nothing changed, but by the same token, everything changed. Because I think people's, you know, people probably don't think it's that different than it was before, but people's willingness to vote for him, you know, the way people see this is completely changed, even though the facts behind the scenes may not have changed that much. That's right. And so I, I wrote a note today on Joe Biden and the common knowledge game, but that quote that you just had, Jack, about how everything changes in our behavior once we believe that everyone else believes it, that that line is actually from a, a much earlier note I wrote about Harvey Weinstein. Because I, I find that these real life examples, you know, as, as good as the Emperor's New Clothes as is as a story, and as much as we all know the story, tying it back to a real world case that we also know, I find can be really powerful. So the fact is, with Harvey Weinstein, everyone in Hollywood knew he was a rapist and a really bad guy. They, he, you know, it wasn't that they all knew the emperor was naked. They all knew that Harvey Weinstein was a rapist. I mean, they're making jokes about it on, on 30 Rock. <laughs> I mean, so it's, it's not like it was, you know, some big state secret that Harvey Weinstein was a really bad guy. And by know about it, I mean it was his business partners, his wife, uh, actors, uh, politicians. They all knew. But so long as it was private knowledge, no matter how widespread, it didn't matter. No one changed their behavior. Nobody Nobody turned down a role. No politician turned down a donation. Um, you know, nobody said, oh, you're not welcome at our party. None of that happened. 
until you had a missionary, in this case it was Rose McGowan, goes out and because she was she was also very famous, and because she said it so loudly, just like that little girl in the Emperor's New Clothes parable or or, or story, everybody heard it. All the people who had been holding this inside, who knew it, who knew it to be true, their whole world changed because now they knew that everyone knew. And then their behavior changed immediately. His wife divorces him. His business partners go, oh, we're shocked, shocked that, you know, Harvey Weinstein's a rapist even though we know they already knew. They had been approving all the settlements for raping people. They were the ones who were increasing their director and officer insurance. Right? They knew. So everything about their behavior changed once you had the missionary say it so loudly and so publicly even though nothing changed in what they already knew. It's exactly your point, Jack, right? I I mean, I was watching this and I was saying, okay, I know what I think about Joe Biden's cognitive abilities, his mental competence for the job, but I, you know, I'm still, I'm still kind of leaning towards the guy, honestly. And then we all saw what we all saw. And you could just see the common knowledge change around you. And it changed, it changed everything about how I think. That, that was the point of our breaking news episode last week. That I had already gotten to the point was, sorry, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I can't support the guy. And that same sort of realization, which is very sad and, and just and, and terribly, I, I think, distressing, was felt by millions of people. But that's exactly the process, Jack. You're exactly right. It was interesting to me, too, like how important, and you, you touched on this on Twitter, how important the reaction like John King on CNN was. Like mm-hmm. what they did right after the debate was over, it, it wasn't just what we had all seen. It was, you know, Democrats are scrambling behind the scenes. They're trying to replace him. You know, Barack Obama's on the phone. Like, can you talk about that, how important that was? Yeah, so, uh, you know, my our, our friend uh, Tom Morgan uh, wrote a note, and he was, he was tweeting me about this the, the, the other day, about a, a, a great example of that, of the crowd starting to respond in the middle of the speech. Because I, I don't know about you, if you're watching, a lot of people watched it with, in a small group. We knew that we were part of an enormous crowd. We knew that there were uh, how many tens of millions of people watching it. And we also mostly watched it with other people, right? Our family, friends. People would go to a watch party, something like that. So you are part of a crowd and you're, you're, you're starting to, to feel the crowd around you respond to what happened just almost immediately. For me, it was my, my Twitter feed started blowing up. I started making a few tweets also. I mean, just three minutes in, it's like, oh my God, what is going on here? And you could, Maybe you got it from your social media. Maybe you got it from somebody texting you, hey, are you watching this thing? Maybe you were watching it with, you started to hear the, the, the murmurs of whatever group you were with watching the debate. So the crowd starts to hear the crowd respond. And I mentioned my friend, uh, our friend Tom Morgan, because he was tweeting me about another case like this, which was uh, Nicolaj uh, Ceausescu the dictator of Romania. This is 1989. He starts giving a speech. It's a televised speech. And the audience starts yelling back at him. And he starts, they start heckling him. And he starts yelling back at the audience. And this is all being televised. And within like a week, the government falls. It's done. It's done. And it's all because the crowd that crowd at the palace square, whatever it was called in Romania and Bucharest, it gets televised to the much larger crowd. The crowd sees a crowd responding in a certain way, and that's what drives this common knowledge formation. So 
all of us, the crowd, we're seeing other crowds start to respond in real time to the talk. And the most, I think, impactful crowd was what you're mentioning, Jack, the CNN panel immediately at the conclusion of the debate. Where, and, you know, these things are, are very scripted and very highly produced. So everyone knows what's happening, and they go directly to John King, and he says, right off the bat, no hemming or hawing, no talking about this. You know, what I'm hearing, again, he's not giving his direct opinion. He's telling you what he's hearing from his crowd. What I'm hearing is that Biden needs to go right off the bat. And it's, so these were the, these are the kind of little missionaries. This is the crowd watching the crowd itself give the reaction. And that's what makes the trickle into a tidal wave. When he says it that way, what I'm hearing, mm -hmm. there's something else I feel like that happens in that moment. Because when he says what I'm hearing, everybody else who's watching it goes, hey, me too. Like there's mm -hmm. an incredible validation that happens in that little moment. There's a ripple effect. That's exactly right, and 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 it's and it's very intentional, uh, and you'll see it all the time on these on these panels uh, of talking heads and the like. You, there are only a few people who have the, I call it the missionary star power, to say I think X. And the missionary throughout this whole thing one of those people with that incredible missionary star power was in fact Joe Biden himself. I mean, Joe Biden was himself the little girl saying, oh my God, the emperor has no clothes. And saying it so loudly. And then Matt, you're absolutely right. So, so everyone else who wants to have a voice, and that's why they're panelists on these CNN things. They they're good at this. John King's very good at this. And he's not inserting me what John King thinks, because as, as recognizable as he is, he doesn't have the missionary star power that a Biden does, that Obama does, that pretty much anyone does. I'm hard-pressed to think of anyone on those panels that has that kind of uh, independent missionary power. So what you do, you say, well, I'm, I'm talking to other people. Other influential people are telling me this is a disaster. This is a problem. The guy's got to go. And it is incredibly validating, Matt, in both the way you describe that, okay, he's also hearing from other people just like I was on my, you know, Twitter feed or DMs or the like. He's, I'm, I'm hearing that too. And we humans are hardwired to respond powerfully if we see a group of other humans behaving in a certain way. It, we, we, are, we are literally hardwired to respond that way so that when John King says, I'm hearing from lots of people, it's exactly why Trump says, you know, Many people say, everyone says, if the same reason the, the New York Times says, experts say, that construction, that linguistic construction to say that lots of people are saying something, is very powerful. And it, 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 it changes the way we think about things. And also with someone like John King, you know, my assumption in watching it is these are very powerful people. Um, you know, he seems to be a very connected guy, at least the way you watch it. So it's like he, he's talking to high level people or something. You know, at least I don't know if that's true, but that's the way I saw it, like watching it. Of, of course, of course. And, and that, and, and it's the power of someone on a stage or behind a microphone or in front of a camera. We ascribe to them a importance that whether it's true or not, I mean, maybe it's his, you know, his John King's uncle who's texting him. I don't think so, right? But, um, but, but yes, yes, that's exactly right, Jack. It's all, it's all designed to give you that impression. 
because we're hardwired to respond positively to it. Once something like this becomes becomes common knowledge, is there anything that could be done? I mean, is there an appearance on 60 Minutes he could do? Is there a better performance in the next debate? Is there anything that can be done at this point? Nope. Nope. I mean, I mean, I'd love to tell you there is, but the short answer is no, there's not. You can't. And the, and the reason I say that, and the reason I say that so emphatically and definitively, is it goes back to this notion of game theory, that there are rules to these games. And this is the games for whether it's common knowledge or, you know, we've all heard probably of the Prisoner's Dilemma game, uh, the game of chicken. Um, you know, there, there are rules to these games and they have, right, $10 phrase alert, an uh, uh, equilibrium outcome. And all that means is they have a stopping point. They have a winner. I mean, it may not be a winner, right? But it is a stopping point. It's a stopping point. It may not be a permanent stopping point, but it's a it's a strong stopping point. That's all that's all that phrase means, an equilibrium. So there is an equilibrium to the common knowledge game. It takes a lot to move it. It takes a lot to form it. But once it's formed, it's it's quite stable. So there, there, there's no unringing this bell, uh, and it, and I'll, I'll I'll prove it to you, which is that we're all looking for Biden's next flub. We're all looking for it. You know I'm saying you need you know I'm right. You know I'm right, and I know I'm right because CNN was looking for it that night, that night. So they, they keep the cameras on after the debate is over. Trump walks off the stage. Jill Biden comes on. Good job, honey. The cameras stay on. The cameras linger. The cameras are waiting and watching to see how does he exit the stage. And sure enough, you know, he needs help getting down three-inch stairs, steps, not stairs, steps, two steps. He needs help. It was not an accident that the camera was on. It was no accident that that whole night the commentator said, no, 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 let's, let's flip back to, uh, you know, Jill and Joe are doing their little post-celebratory thing there with the crowd. It's no accident they all went back there. It's no accident the cameras were on because... Now, this is, this is the game. We're all waiting for the next inevitable flub and moment of frailty and cognitive decline. And it's going to come because we all know it. That's the other reason why this was so powerful. You can't, don't try to tell me, oh, he had a cold or, oh, he had a raspy voice. <laughs> We've all had parents and grandparents. We've all had this conversation with our partners and spouses and siblings about what to do. We all know it. We all know he's got a stutter. And we all know this ain't that. We all know it. And after Thursday night, we all know that we all know. And so it never goes away. This is the new equilibrium. This is the new outcome. For the rest of his life, Joe Biden is going to be watched. Every public statement, every public step, every public appearance, he's people are watching him for the fuck up. I mean, can you imagine what kind how 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 awful it would be to have to go through life like that? And I think that's what makes a lot of us so angry. That's what makes a lot of us so angry. I want to take this to the zeitgeist. Because I think this is, this is the question. This is no longer where... So as a person with a lot of background in improvisational things in, in my life mm -hmm. and stuff like this, the beauty about doing something that's improvisationally based, to be it like music or jazz or anything, uh, improv comedy, if you want in front of a group is the audience is basically rooting for you to fail and then delighted with surprise when you succeed. But they're, 
the the tension is created by you can't possibly do this. 100%. This is not that. This is you can't possibly do this. And I'm actually, I'm kind of rooting for the failure in the, mm-hmm. there's no speech where he turns around and all of a sudden it's like, oh, he's back. There's no off night from this. You, nope. you said it, you said in the nope. piece, no Democrat who sees a future for themselves in politics is going to commit wholeheartedly to the Biden Harris campaign now. This is the zeitgeist. What the heck happens next? Uh, the campaign is finished. The 2024 uh, Biden Harris campaign is finished. They may not know it yet, but it's done. It's over. Uh, it, you can't, you, this is not fix a bowl. You can't go out the next day and read a speech from a teleprompter and people say, oh, he's fine. Not after Thursday night. You could before, and that's what, like, the State of the Union, when he gets out there and he reads uh, from a teleprompter. Great, he can read. (laughs) There's no surprise and delight of the crowd from that success. This is the problem here. There's only... Nope. Yeah. No, exactly. We're we're all done, and, and, and everybody will notice, oh, well, he's just reading from a teleprompter. And... And everyone, every media, every reporter is now looking for the flub. They're not, no one's trying to cover it up anymore. No one's trying to look away. Nobody's trying to say, oh, it's just partisan. Everyone's looking for it. Everyone's looking for it. And and they're going to find it. Because he's 81 freaking years old. And we all know what's going on. We We all know what's happening here. So what's next, Matt, is it's over. And, and it's over, but no one, it's in no one's advantage who sees a future for themselves in democratic politics to say it's over. You don't want to be the guy that's seen as sticking the knife into Biden's back. But at the same time, you do not want to be associated with it. Every one of Biden's cabinet appointees, they're like Harvey Weinstein's business partners. They knew. They've known all along. But now it matters because we all know that we all know. So they're trying to distance themselves. Every one of them. Every one of them is trying to distance themselves. They'll say nice things in public, but I promise you, every one of them is trying to flee this sinking ship as fast as humanly possible, because we all know another flub is coming. It's coming. There's no unringing the bell. There's only the next flub. And you don't want to be that courtier that goes on saying, oh, No, the naked emperor, he's wearing this fine suit of clothes. He's sharp as a tack. When we all know that we all know that that's a lie. So it's over. It's like like a chicken with his head cut off. It could run around for a little while. Maybe it runs around to the the election, which that's, that's possible. Or it runs around so long to the point where No, you can't legally get another replacement candidate, but it's over. It's done. Just to confirm, so he has zero chance now to win the election if if he makes it that far. Um, I don't want to say he's got zero chance because there is always the possibility that the other guy who we haven't talked about because this ain't about him, that the other guy could fuck it up even more. I, unlikely, but yeah, what what we're talking about here is not yeah. This isn't about Trump, right? It's not about the comparison with Trump. It's not about the political contest with Trump. It's about that moment in time where what we all know that we all know about Joe Biden changed irrevocably. That's what happened on Thursday night. Now the debate and the election. And who's going to win? That's a different question. I find it very hard to believe that this campaign, which will have people leaving it in droves, which nobody will want to be associated with, 
I find it hard to believe that that campaign can possibly win, but a campaign is another strategic interaction. And when you're dealing with a high-functioning sociopath like Donald Trump, you know, he could mess it up even more. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but if I were a betting man, and I am, I'd be willing to lay some pretty long odds that it's Trump in November in a walk, in an absolute walk, if it is still Biden and Harris all the way to the end. Doesn't have to be, though. I think they can absolutely make the change. It's just the dynamics are really tough because, you know, Matt, you asked what's next. If I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm one of the people who's being suggested as taking the place of Biden, I'm saying, screw that. Why, why would I want to put myself out there as the overambitious traitor, basically? Why would I want to do that when I can just wait till 2028, assuming we still have elections in 2028, right? I'll just, I'll just wait till 2028, and then, you know, I won't, I won't have pissed off the, the Biden apparat chicks. Um, Pete and Kamala will be totally damaged goods. So, you know, if I'm a governor or if I'm, you know, a senator who's thinking, oh, and all senators think they're, they should be president, I'm thinking, why would I put myself out here now? I mean, yeah, Trump's beatable, but this is a really tough road right here. I'm just going to wait till 2028. It'll be open for me. That's what I'm going to do. So nobody's going to put themselves out there and say, follow me and, you know, lead the charge. But everybody is distancing themselves. Everyone is saying, oh, you know, it wasn't my fault that we're running a guy who's not mentally competent to be president of the United States. So is this the hardest part here? There's no, there's the little girl to point out the problem that everybody knows that everybody knows, but there's not the little girl to like point at the solution and not just be a little girl saying I have the answer. Like there's no common knowledge didn't work like that. Common knowledge didn't work like that. You know, Jack, I think this might be a good time to do the, uh, the, the, the tweet of the week. Because I think that plays directly into what we're talking about. Get that tweet of the week up on stage because President Obama, this is just a really, former President Obama, this is a really interesting perspective on this. What are we looking at here, Jack? Yeah, it was interesting. This is this is one I kind of got wrong at the beginning because, you know, after the debate, there's been all the the news people are all talking about, you know, Barack Obama wants him out of the race. He's going to sit him down the next day and all that stuff. And then fairly quickly after that, this tweet came out, which is uh, by Barack Obama. (laughs) Bad debate nights happen. Trust me, I know. This election is still a choice between someone who's fought for ordinary folks his entire life and someone who only cares about himself. Ben, by the way, I can't look at that word folks the same since uh, I know, I know, I know. It's just it's just everywhere now. I can't. It's how I I got, you know, an email from Joe Biden campaign and they use the word folks four times, four freaking times in one email. I just want to just. Yeah. And by the way, Biden's tweet about this also had the word folks in it. When he, when he yes, it did. Of course it is. No, but, but, yeah. I, but I blame Obama. Obama started the whole folks craze. But anyway, to finish mm-hmm. up, between someone who tells the truth, who knows right from wrong, and will give it to the American people straight, and someone who lies through his teeth for his own benefit. Last night didn't change that, and it's why so much is at stake in November, and then a link to JoeBiden.com. So, yeah. Ben, what was your take on that? It's pure virtue signaling. This is this is Hillary in 2016 all over again, where everybody who's anybody in the Democratic power structure would say, oh, yes, I'm so glad Hillary Clinton's running for president and their in actual enthusiasm or interest in Hillary Clinton running for president was nil, was zero. And that, that, that's Barack Obama right now. Of, he, he doesn't want to be seen as the guy knifing Joe Biden in the back. But at the same time, he's got his lieutenants, his former screen or uh, script writers, screenwriters. They're screenwriters too, right? Um, you know, guys like John Favreau, right? And uh, Ben, um, what's his other name? Anyway, he's got all of his guys out there saying, oh, this is awful. We all saw what we saw. And, and they're not going to 
tear Joe Biden down, but they're also not going to go out of their way to support the guy. They're not going to fundraise. They're 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 going to everyone's going to go through the motions. Everyone's just going to go through the motions. Let this ship sink. And wait for 2028. And nowhere is that more pronounced than with Barack Obama. So you think like behind the scenes, do you think he is like trying to get a new candidate in there or putting pressure on Biden? Or, or do you think really he's just checking out effectively? Well, I, th- I think I think the default is to check out and preserve power and exercise of power for another day when it's not so hard. Because right now it's just really hard. Right. You know, it's. It's it's a really difficult path right now to switch somebody out. Should it be done? Absolutely, it should be done. But it requires somebody to put what's good for the country ahead of what's good for the party and what's good for their own personal political trajectory. And, you know, the first person to raise their hand and do that will be the, or the next person to raise their hand and do that in senior political position will be the first person to raise their hand and do that. That's what it requires. That's what it requires. It requires somebody to say, yeah, I know, you know, this is really not good for me personally, but we've, we've got to do something. So I'm going to really go out there and put myself on a limb and say, Joe, you got to go. And be public a, about it. This is the hole this opens up because it's like on one hand you have the person in the safe brand, the Obama seat is basically like, I don't have to run for president again. I can basically just give it the good housekeeping seal of approval and just kind of like take my hands off it, not really care. Yeah, I've got my Netflix development deal. I'm going to be the next, the first ex-president, you know, billionaire, self-made billionaire. I'll go hang out on Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, wherever he's got his big, you know, one of his estates. And it's all good, man. It's all good if you're Barack Obama. It's, uh, it's funny, Sorry. like I was saying this to Matt before we recorded, and it, it, it's certainly a very dumb suggestion, as most of my suggestions on here are, but like this is almost the time that if you're the Democratic Party, if he did drop out, you go get The Rock or someone like that. Um, you know, you just get someone who could come in and be like completely outside of the whole thing, and you know, because the politicians aren't going to do it. I don't know if that's a dumb suggestion. It's not obviously not going to happen, but it, it is interesting. Well, it'd be a great idea. The problem with it, Jack, is that the people who can have influence and power in these to set this are professional politicians. I mean, yeah. it, because this is a political party we're talking about. And it it's it's a it's a creature that's made up of and elevates people who are high functioning sociopaths who are who are their whole reason for being is to put ego and party ahead of anything else. So that's what's going to happen. Well, Jack, why don't you follow up the dumb suggestion with the dumb question? Which sounds really mean as I'm saying double this out loud. <laughs> the dumb double play. <laughs> don't, we know, no, we're not going to start a segment called the dumb double play. I do enough dumb stuff in here. <laughs> What, um, what do you got for us? Ask, ask this question. Because I think this is a good question because it's, this is so thorny and problematic, but it's another one where we're all thinking about this. And it's not just Joe Biden. I mean, I, I can remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I can remember a press conference Mitch McConnell gave where I was thinking, like, watching it, like, he, he shouldn't be in the public huh. eye anymore. Um, huh. Like, this, this seems to be more happening. I don't know why it's happening more and more, but it seems to be happening more Because more. they're so old, Jack. It's happening yeah. so much more because they're all so old. But like the, the challenge is how do you deal with it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I was thinking about solutions and like everything I would think about, I'd be like, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I mean, it's, you know, on the senators, it's really, really hard to do because, I mean, c- certain senators are in a district that favors, you know, their side of the aisle. The the party's not going to run anybody in the primary against them. So basically until they're dead, they're going to just continue to be able to do it. But can you think of any way we could actually address this problem of having these people who maybe cognitively aren't where they once were, you know, getting sitting in these high offices in our country? No. <laughs> Sorry, wish I had a great suggestion for you, but but no, we're going to do like 
Trump's cognitive tests that he aces and his five questions, you know, whether it was man, woman, horse, whatever it was, it was like, I, I mean, I, it, 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 sorry, I get, I just get speechless every time with it. I mean, Trump is such a, just a ridiculous human being. One day I'll tell you my story of the, you know, the, the debt financing that they were doing, the Trump organization was doing for Atlantic City, I think it was 05 or 06, something like that, that I, I went and listened to them talk. I mean, they're just ridiculous people. They lie like you and I breathe air. I can't, I don't know how else to say it, but they lie. They actually believe the lies. So it's not, I guess it's not really a lie because they actually believe it. They just live in this other universe, this other universe. I, I don't know how to say it other than that, but, but yeah, we're going to end up with cognitive tests. Like, you know, like Trump talks about, I, there's no solution, Jack. There's no solution. Um, unless I, I, I mean, I, I still think the solution in the house of representatives is to, to move towards proportional representation. As a whole nother episode we'll go to. It's yeah, interesting. Almost... Go ahead, Matt. It, it's interesting because of the there's there's just there's just layers. <laughs> there's just layers of these things. And once you're like inside of a religion or you're inside I, I actually think the point you made about it's not a lie because they believe it is really important here. Mm -hmm. If you're bought in on the religion of the thing, and I'm thinking of who is the uh, was it Gary Johnson? Who is the libertarian candidate? This is like two or three yeah. presidential cycles ago. And yeah. like Gary Johnson is a libertarian candidate. So I, yeah. Yeah. So he gets up on stage at this thing. I remember watching this thing just out of like curiosity. And he basically explains to this group of libertarian voters that um he didn't like driver's licenses and driver oh, yeah. license theft was still a good idea. And he gets He's food. on a panel of the You candidates. remember this too. Okay. And and the question comes up, well, are there are there any is there any possible role for anything that government can do that you would approve? And you're just, well, I, I think driver's licenses are kind of a good idea, right? And, oh my, well, you you finished the story. Now, what's the reaction? I mean, in my, in my memory, he basically gets almost booed off of the stage. Like, booed he off the stage. And it's driver's more, license. Those people in that audience believed it. Like, it wasn't a lie to them. It wasn't a so when we get into this spot of like, again, like this is the really hard thing. Like it's, we all just know it when we know it. We know they're too old when we know they're too old. But how can you objectively prove that without being discriminatory? And this is just one of those things where, man, it's like we've painted ourselves into a kind of a funny corner on this. Yeah, we, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird corner because we've got a professional political class now where there's no reason to ever leave. Um, in it, take, it takes a constitutional amendment. Jack is the short answer. It ta it's, it's like term limits. You can't you can't legislate it. It requires a constitutional amendment, and that's effectively impossible today. And you talked about it. I mean, I think for these people and the people around them, you know, once you've had this kind of power, I guess it's just really really hard to give it up. I mean, I I don't know if you watched the thing with Jill Biden like after the debate, but it, it was tough to watch her. I mean, she I mean he you'd think she'd have her husband somewhere comforting him or something like that, and she was just. If she was just screaming, you know, so excited about it. You answered all the questions and it's just, you, you think the people around these people at some point would say, you know, it would be better off for all of us if you would, you know, be with your family right now. It's complicated. And I, I'm, I'm, I had kind of a similar initial reaction on, on Jill Biden. And, um, yeah, I had a conversation with my wife about it and, and I, and I've, I've moderated my position a bit. I mean, if, if I really wanted something like, I think Joe Biden really wants to be president again. Yeah, you want to you wanna support your, your spouse and your partner and what they really want. Um, and you certainly don't want to do anything in public to embarrass them or to shame them. And I have no idea what actually goes on behind closed doors. On the other hand, the aspect, I would, I would be a lot more confident in that kind of kind approach to Joe Biden if she were not, in fact, increasingly putting herself out there 
as a political player in her own right, in her own right, which is clearly part of what's going on. So I, it's a tough one. I'm a mixed mind, but I want to, I, I don't want to, you know, take a hard stand on, on, on Dr. Jill. No, that, that makes sense. And it's, yeah, this, this is all new on things. Start referring to me as Dr. Hunt from now. <laughs> And, you know, what Matt said in the last episode is so true. I mean, these things are tough to watch. I mean, I, I had a family member, my grandmother went to yeah. dementia, and it's just the, it's it's really, really hard. And I don't know if that's like what he has, but I mean, it's it's very, very difficult to watch these things. I mean, Joe Biden has given his, you know, he's given himself to his country for a very long period of time. Like, uh, no one yep. wants this to happen. No, nobody wants to watch nope. this. You know, it's, it is, it's tough. Yep. It's, it's challenging and it's tough to watch. It's sad, which personally is why I've been looking forward to a, um, uh, to, to to Matt somehow, you know, if not lightening the mood, at least changing the tone a little bit. Because you're right, Jack. We've we've all and it's a I'll, I'll end with this, right? Or in my segment with this, right? Um, we all know it, and it's it's not something the, the the antidote to what we call fiat news, to somebody shaking their finger at you and telling you how to think. The antidote to that is always if you have your have, have, have a strong personal experience that gives you a foundation for you to say, no, I think I know what's going on here. And I think that's why it's so difficult for the Democratic Party in this case to gaslight us about this, that, oh, no, he's sharp as attack. We all know what we saw. Now we all know that we all know it. And we, it's personal. It's personal for all of us. We've all had that experience, just like you're describing, Jack. So, you know, I, we're not going to be swayed from that in ways that we could be swayed when we don't have that direct personal experience that hits our hearts really deeply in a very sad way. So Matt, to, to Ben's point, uh, both of our favorite parts here where we, where we always end up on a positive note, uh, what you got in the cultish corner this week? So I, as I teased, and I'm going to amend some of this on the fly here for it because I think it's important. This is definitely less Biden, a little more Beastie Boys in this. But I, I've been thinking about this this story in particular, and I hadn't thought about it from the perspective of how the little girl in the Emperor's New Clothes scenario she calls out the thing that breaks it. She breaks the common knowledge. Mm -hmm. She pierces the ability to talk about this thing. And it's, it's a really important act that it's not another politician who necessarily pierces it, that it's the little girl, the innocent little girl who pierces the thing. Mm -hmm. But then the flip side of it, the little girl, because she's a little girl, also can't undo it. She can't declare a new regime. She can't say, here's the new clothes emperor or starting over. Look how much better dressed my dad is or something. The the crowd has to rebuild and redo that, redo that up. So like the little girl breaks it, but then it's upon the crowd to rebuild the thing and make it new. And that takes tools. That takes all these things. Uh, I've got this idea that just is rattling through my head, thanks to uh, Kyla Scanlon and her new book about just how it's like the, the tree falls in the forest, doesn't make a sound. And I keep thinking like the, it's the expectations tree falling in the reality forest or maybe the other way around like that's the thing it's like oh no no that makes it sound but that tree is to fall but then once the tree falls what are you going to do with it so i have mm -hmm. a story about what to do with the tree and it's a beastie boy story so adam horowitz is like 16 years old and he is doing what a responsible 16 year old in new york city would do at the time and he is skipping school and he is skipping school and he's in his living room with the tv on and out of, out of his ear he's like i know the song and it's this British Airways commercial is on, but he's like, I know that song. And he realizes he knows that song because that's his song. And it's not just this song on the British Airways commercial on television while he's skipping school, but it's the B side to basically the joke single signal single that his group has just recorded. So the beastie boys before anybody really knows who they are yet, has recorded a song where they basically prank call 
the local Carvel guy because Carvel is the distributor making these ice cream cakes in the area and they have this fictitious character named Cookie Puss and they make this song basically prank calling Cookie Puss and they record it and it becomes like an obscure quasi hit in the nascent like early hip hop days of like New York City, this prank call to Cookie Puss. But like all good records, all good singles, it has a B-side and this B-side now has gotten picked up by an international brand British Airways, and it's coming through his television. So he's calling his friends. He's like, I, I don't know how, but this is our song. So they ask a friend of a friend. They tell somebody's mom. Somebody's mom says, oh, you got to, like, we know a lawyer. The lawyer's like, I'm not touching this, but there's the, he was the most junior person in the office. The most junior person in the office, because they're like, somebody gets paid for this. Licensing works this way. So they call, the lawyer calls British Airways, and they get a settlement. So now, Four 16-year-olds, because Kate Schellenbach is still in the group at this point, four 16-year-olds now are awarded a $10,000 settlement each. More money than any of them have ever seen. This is like, holy crap, we got money now. So all of them take their money, they're figuring out what they're going to do, and Adam Horowitz basically goes, uh, since he was 12, when his mother and her friends got together, the beautiful act of community goodness in this, they get together, they pool their resources, and they buy him his first guitar, and that's like him starting as a musician. So he's finally ready to up, upgrade, basically, the guitar with his prize money. So he knows that the same Black Rickenbacker that the guy in the jam plays is on sale used at this one local store for $250. So he gets $250 cash, probably more money than he's ever held in his pocket at this point. Remember, this is like 1983. So $250 cash in his pocket go to the used music store. He's going to buy the black Rickenbacker of his dreams. He's going to retire the, the guitar that he got on his 12th birthday. And he walks into the store. He looks at the guitar. And then he looks over on another shelf and he sees a drum machine. The price tag on the drum machine, would you like to venture a guess? The price is right, gentlemen. $250. He makes a gut decision in the moment. And this is, this is important too. So the drum machine that he gets is this, this drum machine called the Roland TR-808. This drum machine was basically designed and built in the late 70s and then only sold for a few years in the early 80s. And it was basically built to give studio musicians a way to have drum tracks that they could play along to. So it's not a normal thing. And it's also really important because the drum sounds on it are weird. In fact, most of the reviews and why this thing isn't selling anywhere and probably why it's for sale in this obscure New York City used instrument store is because everybody thought it sounded like crap. The thing about the, the TR-808 was, uh, so TR stands for transistor rhythm. And it was these little like analog synthesizers, not samples, but that's why like the bass drum doesn't sound like a bass drum. It's got these hand claps. I promise you, you've heard them a billion times today. But at the time, people were like, what even is that noise? That's awful. And it had this funny thing where you could like pitch shift the different sounds of the drums or the hand claps or whether up and down, which was, again, important for recording a, a demo of something. But that was just it. It was just it was just a demo and it didn't sound good. Nobody liked it. So he takes his $250. He goes, you know what? We really like this rap thing. The cookie push thing worked out well enough for us. No plans to have a rap career yet or go into hip hop production or anything else. But he just decides, I already have a guitar. I don't own a drum machine. I'm going to buy the drum machine. And so he does it. So Adam Horowitz buys a Roland TR-808 with a $250 for the British Airways settlement that he has that just happens to be the exact same price of the guitar that he's supposed to get and he doesn't get it. And so he, he takes it home, plays around with it a little bit. He then decides to take it to his college-aged friend who's been telling all of his friends to call in and request Cookie Puss on the local college station. That friend is Rick Rubin. And the TR-808 goes to Rick Rubin's dorm and then to some other shared studio spaces they're going to do. And whether or not it's on this, I'm still trying to get this data straight. But the very first song that creates a hit for Rick Rubin's dorm room record label, Def Jam, uh, Tila Rocks, It's Yours, arguably uses this drum machine. That drum machine then becomes the one that gets used on Peter Piper by Run DMC. 
It's the same 808 that's Brass Monkey by the Beastie Boys. It's the same drum machine that gets used to program the beats that Adam Horowitz does as a kid when 16-year-old LL Cool J sends his first thing in and they decide, holy crap, this kid could be something. That not only cements the deal for Def Jam as a record label, but establishes them as the force they are today. Like, we don't have Rick Rubin without 16-year-old LL Cool J, and we don't have the sound without Adam Horowitz's $250 drum machine that he got drum instead machine. of that friggin' guitar. Now here's, I got one other like insane detail about this story that I love. So when he's 12 and he decides he wants to play guitar and he gets the guitar, the record he's listening to like right after in his bedroom by himself is this band called Hazy Fantasy. You ever heard of them? This is like early, early yeah. 80s. Like this is this weird European band. And he's like, this is really cool. And it's kind of punky. It's kind of new wavy. It's just, it's out there music. I promise there's like two songs you've actually heard. If you look them up later, it's spelled weird. I'll send you links. Hazy Fantasy. So in trying to figure out how the hell British Airways gets a hold of this song, wouldn't you know it was the guitar player from Hazy Fantasy who heard the song and passed it off without ever licensing it? There you go. Luck as the sound of the expectation tree falling in the reality forest. It's not about what you're supposed to be doing. It's about like what you do after the thing happens and how you do it with your people, for your people, to the benefit of your people. And I, and I love this because this is the part of Ben and your piece where you're saying uh, the only way out is through and the only way through is mm -hmm. together. Not from above through a political party, but from below through a community it's not just at the top level where the little girl says the emperor has no clothes and he's naked. It's the bottom level of what we do with these little lucky breaks and how a whole community can emerge from those things. Man, I'm going to add one thing to what you're saying. Please. It's not just, it's not just what we do with the positive lucky breaks. It's also what we do with the negative, the unlucky breaks. So uh, I, I feel like we're entering a time where it's kind of an unlucky time, right? I mean, it's, but, but, but all the more reason why we've got to make the best of that. Yeah. It's exactly right, man. It's exactly, but it's exactly right. I got notes. Let me read us out on these. We started off big picture, the emperor's new clothes. It's what rational people do to each other. It's the, the kind of friend, I wrote this to myself, the kind of friend who tells you that you've, he tells you the truth. You got broccoli in your teeth. Whatever it is, like these little things, they matter. Because when, as Ben, as you said it, when do people act on what they know? And what do those rules restrict? The missionary, the little girl here who awakens the crowd, and it's the crowd who knows, and then the crowd that then sees, and knows that everybody else sees. In the case of the debate, we all can officially say Biden is too old for this. What I'm hearing the language around it, not I think, but it's the, the hearing triggering people to give them the permission to say me too. These are the big moments we look for when we're looking at common knowledge games in the shift. It's that perspective to go, I, the little girl said it. I saw the look on their faces. Now I know I can say he's naked too. That permission flip is everything. And that's why we can't go back. In the zeitgeist, we talked about how once everyone knows that everybody knows, there's no unringing the bell. There's only the next flub. I love the way you put that, Ben. It can't be associated with Biden if you're, you can't be associated with Biden if you're a Democrat. It's not about Trump now. It's basically about how the Democrats are going to, how, how they're going to deal with this. Our, our tweet of the week, folks, <laughs> folks, that's basically playing the hits. Even if nobody cares, even if there's no heart in it, you're, you're doing this. There's the great Paul Westerberg who uh, was founding member of The Replacements, went on later in his career, he does this wonderful album where it's a little lighter. It's not the punk raucous 80s thing that he was doing. He had an acoustic guitar. He's recording in this old house. And what's he call that album? He calls it Folker. And I think of that all the time. I'm sick of folks. I need somebody to be a folker out there and actually like fight for something. Jack, you had a, <laughs> what did we call it? You had a dumb suggestion and then a dumb question, double play, double header. Can you smell what The Rock is cooking? We're going to find out who the next candidate is. But can we fix the you're too old with this, without being discriminatory? And, and, and no, you folkers, you, we, we can't. We need 
to call this stuff out, but we need like this is democracy. This is what the system is supposed to do. It's supposed to allow votes to aggregate and people to call this stuff out. That's what we need. There's no good way to do it except for us to get involved. And this is probably where I end us today. After the Adam Horowitz story, after all these things, it's just you tell the truth to your friends, you watch the crowd, you got to be in it, but the truth, the trust, the talk to confirm to the crowd that you're willing to reconnect to your people, that you got to be there for the positive surprises, even when the negative surprises are all around you. It's it's the reality of feeling that tree fall in that expectation forest. It's it's down, but let it be for a purpose. If the tree falls, let the purpose be to build something back up together. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Matt. Right on, brothers. I love it. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're watching breaking news so more people can find our show. If you know another clear-eyed and full-hearted individual, why not share this episode with them too? Like we said at the top, the media is making us tick, and it's our job to talk. Follow the headlines at fiatnews.com. Follow Ben at epsilontheory.com and at Epsilon Theory on Twitter. Follow Jack at validiacapital.com and at practicalquant on Twitter. Follow Matt at sunpointinvestments.com cultishcreative.com and at cultishcreative on Twitter.